understanding rapture versus return. Luke chapter 12, verses 36 through 48. And the word of the Lord today from the King James text reads in this fashion. And ye yourselves like unto men that wait for their Lord, when he will return from the wedding, that when he cometh and knocketh, they may open unto him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. Verily I say unto you that he shall gird himself and make them to sit down to meet and will come forth and serve them. And if he shall come in the second watch or come in the third watch and find them so, blessed are those servants. And this know that if the good man of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not have suffered his house to be broken through. Be ye therefore ready also, for the Son of Man cometh at an hour when ye think not. Then Peter said unto him, Lord, speakest thou this parable unto us, or even to all? And the Lord said, Who then? is that faithful and wise steward, whom his Lord shall make ruler over his household, to give them their portion of meat in due season. Blessed is that servant, whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Of a truth I say unto you, that he will make him ruler over all that he hath. But... And if that servant say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to beat the men servants and maidens, time span one from the other. First, there is the rapture of the church. Secondly, there is his second coming, or his physical return to the earth, at which time he will set all things in order and establish his eternal reign with the new Jerusalem as the world's capital. Many today confuse the two events and many false doctrines and false movements have been born of this misunderstanding. The rapture occurs before the second coming, confusing the order of events alone can leave opening to false doctrine and erroneous teaching. For instance, in our primary text today, the Lord speaks, if you look at the entirety of our primary text today, the Lord speaks of reward, listen to me now children, and punishment being meted out, and great responsibility being assigned. He speaks of servants who had not done the master's will, who had not done what they knew the master would have had them to do, being punished, does he not? Yes, he does. He also speaks of those servants who have done as they ought and who have done the will of God, <coughs> being given great responsibility over his household. This language alone speaks, listen to me children, to the second coming of Christ, to the second coming event, not to the rapture. For after the second coming, saints of God, according to the word of God, shall serve as rulers and leaders in the eternal kingdom of our God. Amen. The Word of God said we shall be kings and priests 
unto God. He will make us kings and priests. Therefore, the passage we read today speaks to the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and not to the rapture. Now, what's interesting about this is some false movements have arisen and they try to use this passage of Scripture to suggest that it speaks of their particular organization. They claim that Jesus Christ has returned, but that he has returned spiritually. He has not returned physically. Well, first of all, that's an idiotic notion. There is nowhere in Scripture where Jesus Christ is said to return spiritually and then later follow that up by returning physically. The Word of God never teaches that. There are two events which will take place the rapture and the second coming. If these people's doctrine were true, then it would be true also that the rapture must also have already occurred. The rapture would already have taken place for this notion of the return of Christ. But didn't the Lord warn us? He said, beware, there'll be men who will come and say, lo, he is here, and lo, he is there. These people aren't saying, lo, he's in Israel, or lo, he's in Lebanon, or he's here, or he's there. No, these people are saying, lo, he's in heaven. He's returned, but he's ruling from heaven. But that is not what the Word of God teaches. First of all, we understand the promise of the rapture. John 14, 1 through 3, Jesus Christ is speaking and he said, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. This is the promise of the rapture of the church. If you understand that throughout the entire New Testament, the church is called and likened unto the bride of Christ, then you understand every word that Jesus is speaking in this passage. He is literally speaking in the language of marriage. This is the exact procedure that a man would go through in biblical times when he was to marry a woman. He would espouse himself to that woman, meaning he would engage himself to that woman. He'd become engaged. However, at that point, he would go and he would prepare a place for them to live and dwell together. When the time was right, he would return. When all things were made ready, he would return. He'd gather up his bride. He would take her then to that place which he had prepared for them, where they would live and where they would abide and they would go in and they would consummate their marriage. At that point in time, they would celebrate their union with a great feast and a great celebration. Today, we call them wedding receptions. In biblical times, they called them weddings. They didn't have a marriage ceremony. No, no uh, rabbi stood in front of them and performed a ceremony causing them to be joined in marriage. No, they were joined in marriage only in the eyes of God, only in the privacy of their own dwelling place. And it was there that they would consummate their relationship 
physically thus being married he espoused himself he engaged with her to be married he made that promise he's come he's taken her he's brought her to the place he prepared it is there that the marriage is consummated and it is then that the celebration takes place when Jesus went to the wedding in Cana of Galilee he was going to celebrate the marriage of a couple who had already gone through this process and they had consummated their relationship in that place that they then were going to share together. Got news for you folks. If you look at our primary text today, you will see that Jesus says, he said, and ye yourselves like unto men, listen, that wait for their Lord when he will return from the wedding. Oh, hallelujah. You see, the rapture has to take place because it is after the rapture that the church consummates its marriage to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Hallelujah. And it is then that the marriage supper of the Lamb takes place. Hallelujah. The Word of God said, Blessed are they who are called unto the marriage supper. Glory to God. Not everybody's going to be at the marriage supper. Only those who have made themselves ready as a bride prepares herself for her husband. Oh my goodness. When the new Jerusalem comes down out of heaven, the word of God said that the city, the new Jerusalem, Jesus said, Behold, I, he said, I go and prepare a place for you. Well, what's he preparing? He's preparing what we would call the new Jerusalem. That's our new dwelling place with him. All right? When it comes down out of heaven, the word of God said, It is prepared as a bride <laughs> adorned for her husband. Oh, honey, we're still on our honeymoon. The bride is still in her 60 90. Glory to God. It is adorned as a bride for her husband. This is the place that the groom prepared for the bride. He said, even so, ye yourselves like unto men that wait for the Lord when he will return from the wedding. The second coming of Christ comes after the marriage. The marriage occurs after the rapture. So anybody out there trying to tell you door to door that Jesus Christ returned invisibly that he is spiritually returned and that there are people roaming around on earth of a special class of believers, the anointed class. Uh-uh. Honey, uh-uh. Your doctrine's all out of whack because the rapture has to take place before the second coming has to transpire before the second coming. And the second coming is only always described as a physical return, not a spiritual return. On the day of Pentecost, Jesus Christ returned spiritually for the church. But he said, he will no longer be with you but he shall be what? In you. Therefore, the Spirit of Christ is the Holy Ghost. It is the Spirit of Christ that was poured out on the day of Pentecost. The Word of God said that if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. The word of God declares, For by one spirit are ye all baptized into one body. The spirit of Christ cannot possibly be one spirit and the Holy Ghost another spirit. Because if they're two spirits, then the word of God is lying to us. But it says, By one spirit are ye all baptized into one body. And then the word of God tells us, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Oh, I want to tell you today, 
in this passage where the Lord makes the promise of the rapture where he speaks in the language of marriage I go to prepare a place but I will come back for you I will take you and bring you to where I am in that language it is clear that the Lord is not coming to be with us but that he is coming to take us to be with him he says clearly that where I am. Notice he doesn't say that where we are, that where the Father and the Son are, that where the two of us are. I'm bringing you to be with the Father. He doesn't say that. He said that where I am, there ye may be also. Hallelujah. In Matthew 24, verses 36 through 43, but of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Notice the language Jesus uses here. Knoweth no man. Knoweth no man. But my Father only. God is a spirit. The Spirit of God was aware of this. So even Jesus Christ, God, manifested in human form. That was knowledge that God retained in the Spirit that he kept from the, the physical man, the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, but as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Listen, then shall two be in the field, the one shall be taken and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, the one shall be taken and the other left. Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. But know this, that if the good men of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Why did God in his divine wisdom reserve the knowledge of the day and the hour, the moment of the second coming of Christ? Why did he preserve that unto the Spirit of God, his Spirit alone? He wouldn't even share that with his physical manifestation. He wouldn't even allow his physical man, the Lord Jesus Christ, an extension of himself, a revelation of himself. He wouldn't even let that man know what was going on. Why did God do this? He said, because if the person in charge of the house knew that a thief was coming, and when that thief was coming, he would have made every possible arrangement to prevent the thief from getting in and doing what he was there to do. Got news for you. The word of God says Satan is the prince and power of the air. The word of God says that Satan is the God of this world. When Jesus Christ comes to redeem his purchased possession, that is what the church is called, his purchased possession. We are precious to him. We are valuable to him. He has given us the down payment on our redemption of the Holy Ghost baptism. That's why the Holy Ghost baptism is called the earnest of our salvation. It is the earnest. It is the down payment on our salvation. But when he comes to take us out of here, he literally is going to slip in and steal us away. There will be two men in the field. One will be taken. The other will be left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken. The other will be left. What does that tell us? That tells us after the rapture, there will be some who yet remain. That means that life continues to go on as it had been going prior to this event. Am I telling the truth? 
that is not the case after his second coming. Things do not continue as they had always been after his second coming. Not at all, not even close. Therefore, it is impossible to say the Lord has spiritually returned and he's doing this great work. No, baloney, that's garbage. No, after his second coming, all things will be placed in order. All things will be set in order. But at that point... The marriage will have taken place. The marriage will have been consummated. The wedding, uh, the marriage supper of the Lamb will have taken place in glory. Those who partook in the rapture will partake in the marriage supper of the Lamb. We will return behind the Lord on His white horse in Armageddon. Glory to God. He will return to this earth. The angel told uh, His disciples that He would return how? The same identical way that they had seen him go he physically started on the Mount of Olives and rose upward did he not and the angel said the same way you're seeing him go is the same way he's going to come back a second time so the second coming is not a spiritual second coming the second coming is when the Lord returns he left once he returns once the rapture is not a return of Christ the rapture is merely Christ appearing in the clouds so that his people might be drawn unto him and he might steal us away. Hallelujah. But the second coming is when the Lord physically returns after the battle of Armageddon has been fought and all of this. Okay. All right. Amen. The word of God tells us today. Uh, that one is taken and the other is left. Again, this speaks of believers being swiftly removed and not his physically returning to be with them. You'll notice in our primary text, I told you today, you've got to be careful when you read these passages because it's easy to read a passage and think that it's talking about the rapture when in reality it's talking about after his second coming or it's talking about his second coming. Will there be servants of God in the earth during the tribulation period as the world is going through great tribulation and the judgment of God is unleashed? following the rapture of the church absolutely there will be there are going to be people what does the Bible call us today as born again children of God Jesus said you're no more servants but now you're what? sons but in the passage we read today our primary passage the Lord refers to a man's servants and he refers to them waiting on him returning from the wedding. Do you follow what I'm telling you now? Do you see? So there are going to be people in the earth. Maybe they grew up in church. Maybe they've heard all kinds of preachers like this fat old Pentecostal preacher tell them about the fact that Jesus was coming and he was going to rapture the church. He was going to take the church away. Oh, but they didn't believe it. They didn't have time for that foolishness. They didn't care about that garbage. So they just kept living their lives as unbelievers. But after the rapture, all of a sudden, they're going to remember all the Sunday school lessons they sat through. They're going to remember all the sermons they sat through as a child on the pew of that old church. They're going to remember all the things they learned as a child at their grandma or their grandpa's knee. And they're going to recognize what has happened. And as the events in the world begin to unfold, they're going to easily be able to say, uh-oh, I get it now. I see what's happening. Uh, Jesus has come. This is the tribulation that the word of God spoke of. Honey, it's going to be a hard time. But it's at that point, if you're going to make heaven, you're going to have to serve God with everything you've got. And guess what? For those of you people who don't understand salvation and righteousness, being by faith and you still want to believe that it requires works to make heaven you still have to earn your way into heaven guess what honey you'll have your chance because during the tribulation you won't be a son of God you'll be a servant of God 
and as a servant of God, you see, sons of God and daughters of God are sons and daughters by reason of the indwelling of the Holy Ghost. But child, I got news for you. If you're going to be God's servant during the tribulation period, it's all on you. You, you think you think living for God now when all we got to do is keep our faith intact and keep believing and trusting God and leaning on His grace? You think that's hard. Wait until the tribulation is going full blast and anyone who is a believer, anyone who falls into the category at that point of a servant of God is going to have to literally live their faith out to death if they would have any hope of being saved. That'll be the only option you've got. God asks us in this life now through faith to give our lives to Him. Do you follow what I'm telling you? Honey, after the rapture, it's not going to be by faith. You're going to have to literally live it out in truth. You're going to have to be willing to go to the guillotine. You're going to have to be willing to lay down your life if you would be saved in the end. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? You see, circumstances are going to change after the church is withdrawn from the earth. See, the Holy Ghost doesn't abide in the earth. The Holy Ghost abides in God's people. If you take God's people, guess how much of the Holy Ghost is left? Zero. Zilch. There will be no Holy Ghost in the earth during the tribulation period. No, it's all going to be on you. All the responsibility for your salvation is going to be on you. Say, Pastor, you're making it sound awful hard. Boy, you're making it sound awful heavy. Well, that's why the Word of God said, Blessed are they who are called to the wedding. Hallelujah. I want to tell you that you want to get out of here before you have to go that far. You want to get out of here before it falls on you and you have to do everything in order to make heaven your home, in order to make eternity with the Lord possible. You want to get out on the first train. You don't want to be sitting around waiting for the Lord to come the second time. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? But there are going to be people, even during the tribulation, Tommy, they're going to say, well, you know, I've been sitting here trying to believe. I've been sitting here trying to hold fast, and I've been trying to be a servant of God, but I'm getting tired of the ridicule. I'm getting tired of the persecution. I can't take it anymore. I might as well just get drunk and drink until this thing's over. I might as well just get high until this thing is over. I might as well just go along with the program until this thing is over, because they don't have the fortitude. They don't have the strength of character to be able to hold out to the end. And those are the servants the Lord speaks of that he'll come and find are not behaving as they know the Lord would have them to behave. Remember what I said? I keep repeating myself. At that point, it's all on you. You better be acting right. You better be believing right. You better be doing what you know you've got you're supposed to do. Oh, children, listen to me now. In 1 Thessalonians 4, uh, verses 14 through 17, For if we believe, the Apostle Paul writes, that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus, listen now, listen to the language, sleep in Jesus, will God bring with him. Jesus said, if I go, prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, you may be also. Paul said, those which sleep in Jesus, will God bring with him? Who's doing the bringing? Jesus is doing the bringing. My Lord, have mercy. Listen, for this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord, speaking of the rapture of the church, shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. 
then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them. With who? With the dead that have gone up first. In the clouds. So Jesus does not return physically at this point. We're caught up together with them in the clouds. Who's them? With the Lord who's already called the dead up. Now the life follow. To meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Meaning, after that, we will never again be separated from the Lord. Hallelujah. This passage uses the words caught up, which, which clearly then speaks of the rapture. The rapture absolutely must precede the second coming. As the Lord makes it clear that following the rapture there will be a series of horrors and horrific events which will be visited upon the unbelieving world immediately afterwards. If you look at Matthew 24, 14 through 21, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, Whoso readeth, let him understand. Mind you, you read the words here. Whoso readeth, let him understand. In other words, what the Lord is saying here is understandable. People can understand exactly what he's saying. Okay? Daniel speaks of the Antichrist. Daniel speaks of the Antichrist standing in the Holy of Holies in the temple in Jerusalem and declaring himself to be God. Here Jesus said, when ye therefore, when ye therefore, what have I told you how many times when you read the words you, ye, when it speaks in those terms, it's talking about the church, believers. When it talks about them, they, it's talking about the world and unbelievers. He said, when ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. Oh my goodness, listen to me children. What the Lord is telling us is when the Antichrist enters the temple, stands in the Holy of Holies and declares himself to be God, the Lord said, Time's up. <laughs> Boom, there goes the alarm clock. Hallelujah. It's time for rapture. Glory to God. It's time for the church to exit this world. Why? Because the judgment of God on the unbelieving world is about to be unleashed. And the word of God teaches us. Will not the God of all the earth do right? God will not judge the righteous with the wicked. The word of God declares judgment must first begin where? At the house of God. The church has already been judged before the rapture. The church has already gone through a three and a half year period during which there is persecution and there is ridicule. There's all kinds of stuff coming at the church. But that is where the tree is shaken and the good fruit hangs on and the bad fruit falls off. And then the rapture. The Lord removes the true church and all that is left is the bad fruit. Come on now, people who went to church but didn't really believe this thing. People who played church, but they weren't really committed to this thing. Those that didn't believe at all, people that didn't care to believe, people had no interest in believing. People who were willing to accept the Antichrist as the God of this world. 
And the Lord said, when you see him commit the greatest abomination that any human being can ever commit, standing in the Holy of Holies, declaring himself to be God, he said, honey, don't even look, oh, ha, ha, mm, mm. said, don't even turn around to look back. Don't even think about going downstairs to get some clothes. Don't even think. In other words, he's basically just saying, you haven't got time to do a whole lot of nothing. Hallelujah. Because that is when the Lord is going to redeem his people. He said, then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house, neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe unto them that give that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days, meaning those that are pregnant and those that have newborn children. He said, Woe unto them that are uh, bearing children at that time. But listen, he said, verse 20, but pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. For then shall be great tribulation. When? After your flight. What does flight mean? The term flight here speaks of a rapid escape or departure. Hallelujah, that's what the rapture is. It's a rapid escape or a rapid departure. We use the word flight today to speak of travel by air. Where did they get that word from? Why did they use the word flight when they refer to birds that fly or, or uh, us taking flights? It refers to a rapid departure. Amen. You don't ever see a bird take off flying by just going... No, every time they take off, they got to start flapping them wings and flapping them hard, don't they? Amen. Or they have to run and start flapping. Or if you see an airplane, have you ever seen an airplane just sitting on the ground and start driving about 10 miles an hour and then lift off into the air? No, 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 no. If that thing's going to get up into the air, it has to move quickly. Do you follow what I'm telling you? See, all of the terms we use today, we use because even in antiquity, it referred to a rapid escape or a rapid departure. He said, for then shall be great tribulation, which is a trouble, a great trouble or suffering. He said, uh, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. Oh, children, I want to tell you, there is a rapture. There is a time when Jesus Christ is going to appear in the clouds and he is going to draw the saints of God away so that we might escape the judgment that is to come upon the world. God does not judge the righteous with the wicked. And the moment the Antichrist commits the greatest abomination that any man could ever commit, we need to just look up. In another place, the Lord said, look up, for your redemption is at hand. When you see this transpire, he said, look up, your redemption is at hand. Glory to God, amen. The second coming, on, uh, on the other hand, is a different event. In Matthew 25, verses 28 through 32, Take therefore the talent from him, speaking of the parable of the talents, when the Lord gave his servants talents, you recall, and give it unto him which hath ten talents. For unto every one that hath shall be given, and he shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. And cast ye the unprofitable, what is the term again used here? Servant into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Listen, this is how we know he's talking about the second coming and not the rapture. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory and before him shall be gathered all nations 
and he shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. This is speaking of the second coming, not the rapture. The Lord isn't going to rapture good and bad and then separate the good from the bad. Am I telling the truth? No. He said, this is when he comes with all his glory, with all the holy angels with him. Then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory, and before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another. The Lord speaks of all the world being gathered before him at the establishment of his earthly reign. This passage refers to the second coming. We look at Revelation chapter 5, verses 8 through 10. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayer of saints. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. In our primary text today, the Lord spoke of him returning, the Lord returning from the wedding holding the servants accountable, punishing them. You'll notice he also refers to degree of punishment. He said those that were worthy of many stripes will get many stripes. Those that are worthy of few stripes will get a few stripes. You can't pull this out of context, folks. You're Jehovah's Witness, folks. You know, it cracks me up how y'all just love pull stuff out of context, pull this verse out, and all the rest of it just floats out there all by itself, unattended to and undealt with. But he talks about a time of punishment and reconciliation that is the second coming, not the rapture. At the second coming, he will have made us kings and priests. Do you follow what I'm telling you now? It says he'll make them ruler over much. Those who have been faithful over little shall be rulers over much. He's talking about the saints that were worthy of the rapture. Those who participated in the rapture, that includes both the dead and the living. Now listen. In 2 Peter 3, 9 and 10, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as the thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Is this referring to the rapture? No. This refers to the second coming. Do you follow? Do you see how if you read it and you look at it in context, it's not very difficult to understand which of those two events it's speaking of, right? There will be many believers or professed Christians who will not be included in the rapture. While they professed him with their mouths, they denied him by their conduct. As I've recently preached, our actions are far more important than our words. You remember I talked about that recently? They professed him with their mouths. But they denied him by their conduct. Peter, on the other hand, denied him with his mouth, but he was faithful to him by his actions. Do you follow? Amen. These same people will recognize that the rapture has occurred and will then be burdened with the difficult task of evangelism. Even under these dramatic and obviously difficult circumstances, there will be those who will choose to slack off and neglect their duties in favor of going along with the world in an effort to avoid persecution and ridicule. But some will endure. They'll endure the trials of the great tribulation period. 
and they will emerge victorious in their faith and thus worthy to be made partakers with the saints of God after the Lord's earthly return. In Revelation 7, 9-16, the word of the Lord tells us, After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne, and unto the Lamb. And I've explained to you in the Greek, the word and, A-N-D, is uh, from the uh, Greek word that also can be translated as even. And unfortunately, in the King James, there are many instances where they use the word and because they favor Trinitarian theology, and they think that plays better into their Trinitarian theology, because if you were to read this otherwise, it would say, salvation to our God which sitteth upon the throne, even unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne, and about the elders, and the four beasts, and fell down before the throne on their faces, and worshipped God, saying, Amen, blessing, and glory, and wisdom, and thanksgiving, and honor, and power, and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes, and whence came they? And I said unto them, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore are they before the throne of God, and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb, which is in the midst of the throne, shall feed them and shall lead them unto living fountains of waters, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. For those Christians today who choose law over faith and a belief that works are needed to earn salvation, you'll have your opportunity to be saved under those terms. During the tribulation, those who believe will have to endure persecution and ridicule. Many will even be forced to choose death over denial of their faith and their profession of Christ. But there will be no grace during that period. You will either truly endure... I hope you're hearing me now. You will either truly endure to the end or choose to abandon faith in Christ in favor of security and comfort. There will be no overlooking our conduct in deference to our faith, as all that will matter during this time is our actions. You will have to live what you claim to believe, even to the point of choosing death or be lost. How much easier the path is today for believers who choose to be saved today under the terms of grace. Hallelujah. Why would anyone want to risk being caught a, a risk not being caught away and spared the nearly impossible burden of choosing death over denial? Why would anybody want to do that? I don't know. Folks, there are two great events spoken of in the Word of God. There is the rapture of the church, and there is the second coming, or the return of Christ, His second advent. 
his return, physical return to earth. These are two separate events. The rapture must precede the second coming. I know I was in the Church of God many years ago, and the Church of God was a deeply what we refer to as, there are three theories within uh, tribulation theology, you know. Uh, you have what they call pre-tribulationists, you have mid-tribulationists, and you have post-tribulationists. That means there are some Christians who profess to believe that the church is raptured prior to all tribulation. There are others who talk about, uh, they believe that we're raptured in the middle of the tribulation. And then there are others who believe that the church is not raptured until after all seven years of the tribulation are complete. I had, when I went through my internship in the Church of God, I had to go for testing at a church in Connecticut where I was in my internship and the pastor of that church uh, was one of the most brilliant men that I've ever known. Uh, absolutely, I can't even describe to you how, how mind-boggling brilliant this man was. You could literally name a scripture to him, any scripture you want to call out. And he had it committed to memory. He could literally quote any scripture you could ever name. I never saw a human being that had that kind of capability in my life. But he was a brilliant man. And one day I was there for testing. You know, we had to read books during the course of the, um, the uh, internship program. We read books about Christian counseling. We read books about grief counseling. The whole idea of the program is to make men and women ready for ministry, you know, who may not have had an opportunity to go to Bible college and what have you. They claim it was two years of Bible college crammed into a little less than a year. It was an extremely intense program. Uh, I think it was a wonderful program, and I'm grateful for having had the opportunity to go through it. But this pastor and I were talking when I went to take my test one day, and he asked me out of the blue, he said, let me ask you a question. He said, do you believe in the pre-tribulation, post-tribulation, or mid-tribulation theory? Which of those do you ascribe to? Well, I knew that the Church of God was vehemently pre-tribulation. Uh, honestly, I, I mean, I love the Church of God, and I love Church of God people. But honestly, folks, i got to tell you, from, from a theological perspective, as far as I'm concerned, they were a bunch of cowards. They were scared to death of the whole notion of tribulation, and bless God, they wanted to believe the Church was coming out before anything hit, you know. And, and that honestly had a lot to do with just not understanding the nature of the tribulation and, and understanding all that the Word of God teaches because it's not just found in the book of Revelation. It's not just spoken of by the Apostle Paul. But you have to go back into Daniel. Daniel spoke about the Antichrist and about the tribulation a lot. So you, you have to, you know, the Scripture said line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. So you have to go to Revelation. You have to go to the epistles. You have to go to uh, Daniel and put the whole thing together to, to draw a complete picture of what's going to transpire. Well, I knew the church God was pre-tribulation, and I thought, oh, dear Lord, he's trying to trick me. If I say I don't embrace the pre-tribulation, he might just jump down my throat, and bless God, he knows the Bible a whole lot better than I do. I'm, I'm pretty sure of that. And I was just scared to death to answer him, and he kept pushing and pushing. Finally, I said, now you've got to remember, I was all of 18 years old at the time, you know. So finally, I answered him, and I said, Well, brother, I said, to be honest with you, I believe in the mid-tribulation. I believe the church will be raptured in the middle of the tribulation. Uh, I believe the first three and a half years is God's judgment on the church. The second three and a half years is God's judgment on the world, the unbelieving world. And... It's interesting because three and a half is the number of years that the Lord had an earthly ministry. 
So the Lord devotes three and a half years to the church's judgment or to the shaking down of the church and then three and a half years to the world. And anyway, he stood there and he kind of looked at me for a while and all of a sudden this grin cracked his face and he said, I absolutely agree. And I, I, I almost passed out because I knew this man knew his Bible every which way to look. And I knew if there was anybody that might have caught something I missed, it was him, you know. And he and I began to talk about it. And he said, you know, he said, when Daniel talks about in the midst of the days, in the midst of the week, you know, and, and Daniel's literally telling us in the middle of the week something happens, that this major event transpires right at the middle of the the week, you know, and even to the point of breaking it down to the number of days. The thing is, none of us know when the first three and a half years will begin, obviously. We don't know when uh, the first three and a half years is going to start. And uh, so, therefore, there's no way somebody can say, well, Brad Scott, if your theory is right, then you can know the day the Lord's going to come. No, you can't, because you don't know when it's going to begin in reality. But I'm here to tell you folks, men much wiser than I <laughs> have come to understand this thing the same way this old preacher has understood it. And I've searched it out and studied it for many, many years. I want to be ready when Jesus comes. Hallelujah. I want to be ready for the rapture. I want to be one who is considered uh, worthy of attending the marriage supper of the Lamb. Amen. I don't want to have to wait around for the second time. Amen. I'm not interested in hanging out for three and a half years of trouble and struggle. Look at the hell and high water our nation went through for four years under a wicked and demonic and devilish politician. Multiply that by a thousand and imagine three and a half years under a character who will make Donald Trump look like the Archangel Gabriel. Amen. I want to be ready. There's an old song that said, Sign me up for the Christian Jubilee. Write my name on the roll. I want to be ready, ready when Jesus comes. Amen. Praise.